Hello everyone, welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Jitendra. This is a conversation with Paul Chisek. He is a professor of neuroscience at the University of Montreal. Paul's research mainly focuses on how the brain controls behavior. In this conversation, we talk about why modern neuroscience needs evolution, contribution of psychology to neuroscience, brain as a computer, and what does modern AI is lacking. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi, Paul. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Jitender. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, actually. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, so as a neuroscientist, um, the, the first question that I want to start is, what is the meaning of understanding the brain? What, what are we looking for? Are we looking for uh, sort of definitions? Are we looking for semantics? Or uh, we are looking for mathematics? So in, in, in a way that be a, sort of an explanation in the language of science. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, uh, I come from computer science, actually and then computational neuroscience. So, so for me, the way I got sort of introduced really into science was, was modeling, essentially. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's trying to, if we could simulate it, um, then we, we, we have a certain understanding, certain level of understanding. So a little bit like what Richard Feynman famously said um, just before he died, that you know, what, I, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, and I think you know if if we can um, if we can simulate and make predictions, you know, ideally in in really quite quantitative mathematical predictions, um, then I I feel we have a really good understanding. Um, now, in in the case of neuroscience, that's extremely hard, and there's very few cases where we really have that level of understanding. I think the Hodgkin-Huxley equations for neurons are one example. And, but there's not really that many others that have been that successful and that powerful. So, so it's not like physics. Um, but I think that's kind of what we, what we aim for, even though the, the models are always highly simplified. So I think understanding is making predictions. If a theory makes good predictions, it's a good theory. And, uh, and a mathematically expressed one uh, is, is even better because then it's, it's quite... Uh, quite well defined and um and it's not about semantics it's about function it's about uh operation etc uh, so that's that's for me what i what i like now very often when i uh my work is does have a computational aspect but very often i'm quite satisfied with just a kind of a prediction a qualitative prediction and what do you think where is the current neuroscience heading? Um, are we going for those models that they predict better or uh, we are uh, going for more of the semantic thing? Um, well, I don't know. I think we're going in lots of different directions. Um, and, and I think this is probably true in any science that certain directions become fashionable and others become less fashionable. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think people generally in neuroscience are much more interested in models and in computational models, um, uh, much more so than they were, you know, 30 years ago, uh, where computational neuroscientists were seen as a kind of a kind of weird fringe group. Uh, now it's quite acceptable, but um, but that doesn't mean that we're all in agreement. Like I, I don't, you know, I don't agree with what a lot of people uh, consider uh, the types of models they want to build. Um, I have different opinions. You know, I, I'm in one camp, but there's other camps. And, you know, certain things that are very trendy these days, I think are actually um, not, not really a, a useful thing to pursue. Um, but I do think that, yeah, I think people really like uh, trying to make it um, predictive and uh, um, hypothesis driven, although there is a there is a trend for people to to just want to say, well, let's just fit it without a hypothesis. Um, but again, I my own preference is to have a good hypothesis expressed as a model and then um, tested through specific experiments. That you know, that's that's my own preference. 
Um, regarding semantics, uh, yeah, so that's a whole other topic, right? The, the semantics of how we define the problem. I think that's where, um, that's where we're really in trouble, I think, in neuroscience, unlike many other fields of science. I think we're, we've, we're, very, we're, we're very preliminary in how we defined our problem, even though our uh, answers might be, might be really sophisticated. I think our questions often are not. Yeah, and when we are talking about semantics and other camps, let's talk about psychology, how psychology has um, contributed to neuroscience. Uh, well, um, I think, I think psychology, um, I think psychology is, is, it's important because it focuses on, uh, behavior. Um, whereas neuroscience often gets caught up in very, um, kind of detailed physiological mechanisms that don't, you know, without a real connection to behavior. Um, so I think in a, in a sense, psychology keeps us connected to the actual larger functional questions. Um, I do think though that psychology has a very tortured past and it's still suffering from that um, in that it, it, it grew out of philosophical viewpoints that were really non-scientific and it had a very hard time separating itself from those viewpoints. And I don't think it has really separated itself from its sort of non-scientific past where certain beliefs were held as, you know, going back to, you know, ideas about dualism and, and the non-material soul and things like that, that have, you know, that defined psychology. Um, psychology is the study of the psyche, right? And uh, the psyche is this non-material mind, which, you know, really almost nobody believes uh, in, in scientific, um, you know, research, but it still defines so much of what we do. And, and so, so I think psychology is, is necessary, but it's sort of, um, I, th I think at least, um, that it has a lot of the wrong foundations, uh, in large part because it focused so much originally on sort of introspective accounts of the human mind um, as the, the basic um, you know, laying out the basic landscape of what it is that we want to explain. And I think it turns out that that doesn't actually fit with uh, what we know about biology. I think, I think biology, the more we study the brain, the more we realize that our ideas about the mind were just, just, just wrong. I mean, they were just not uh, framed properly. Um, and and so we, we need to be willing to abandon some of those ideas. Uh, not, not the data, but, but the ideas that are used to interpret them. I, I think we just have to be willing to abandon them, which doesn't mean that they're all should be abandoned, but we should not have this attitude that these are the, these are the things and we have to explain these things. And, uh, and then we just have, and when, when we're stuck with it, I, I don't think we should have that attitude. So in a sense, I think psychology because of its traditions uh, is, is holding things back. Uh, but on the other hand, you can't just do without it because then you can't just do, um, you know, just biological, physiological process without confronting some of those larger issues, including, including mental issues, I mean, including introspection. But, but I guess that, you know, it, uh, there's, there's this historical separation between physiology and psychology that has um, been around, you know, for over a hundred years. And, uh, and it's still, that gap is still being felt, I think. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, as you probably, sorry? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. As you probably know, lots of people are saying this. Lots of people are saying this from all, all kinds of directions uh, that, that we need to reframe um, psychological concepts. Yeah, and also the the fact that so basically when it comes to neuroscience, uh, as you already mentioned, that there were many concept theories which were um, we can now fairly say that they they are anthropocentric, right? Yeah. So yeah. what we actually need is I think this to um, sort of remove those ideas which are anthropocentric and which we can't uh, sort of 
think of or apply beyond uh, humans. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that we're, we are one species um, and the nervous system um, that we have um, isn't really about what we do um, because it's shared with animals that do nothing of the sort. And so a lot of the architecture and, and functional organization of the nervous system is not about the special things that we uh, excel in, just like uh, the nervous system and the physiology of, you know, of a hummingbird is not just about its specific uh, exceptional abilities of flight. Uh, there's lots of things that that are are basic to all animals, and in, in fact, the majority. Uh, I think in, in humans, in humans in particular, because we have changed, you know, we have changed uh, our, our lifestyle a lot, and yet our brain is is remarkably similar. Um, and so I think understanding um, that similar aspect of our brain, at least similar with other primates, um, is, uh, is necessary, I think, to make sense of how it all works, how, how we construct our specializations on top of that. Whereas in psychology, of course, it started with humans. It started with, you know, human adults, actually. Um, and, and then other animals were mostly seen as, as models, as sort of simplified versions of that adult human. Um, but that's not, that's kind of reversing, re, that's kind of reversing the history that constructed the system. And, and, and so it's going to lead us in the, it, it surely cannot lead us in good directions. Let's talk about the other analogy that mostly people use. And as a computer scientist, probably you can justify it. Yeah. Um, about brain as a computer. So is it really yeah. like a computer? Well, um, yeah, I think that's, that's also, that's been a troubling analogy, I think. Um, so, so the brain, you know, it, as, as you may know, um, historically, the brain has always been compared to the most um, impressive technological advance of the time. So uh, during the the Middle Ages, it was a system of tubes, like like irrigation systems. Um, during the you know Renaissance, with you know Industrial Revolution, it was it was gears and, and pulleys, etc. And now it's computers. Um, and and I think uh, you know that we we're almost it's it's almost like we are. Um, we can't help ourselves making these kinds of analogies. Now, the analogy with a computer with computers is 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 rather good in some ways because um, so much of what it is, what the brain does, is controlling sort of behavioral. Um, it's controlling behavior, controlling our actions, and and the um, <clears throat> the computer. Um, the computer metaphor really is, is of an input output device um, that processes information. And I think that, of course, in some sense, the brain does process information. Of course it does. Um, but is it, is it like a computer? Um, and I think, uh, I, th I think it's not. And, and I'm not talking about the way it's organized with a central processing unit uh, and a separate memory store and, you know, the various components of a actual modern computer. Um, that's not, that's not the problem with the analogy. I think the problem with the analogy has more to do with what kind of uh, function does a computer implement versus a brain implement. Um, and computers are fundamentally um, input processing and output. And it might seem that the brain is like that, but, it, but it's not. The brain is not a machine for converting inputs into outputs. It's a machine for producing outputs that result in good inputs. Um, in other words, it's a control system. Um, so it's, its very purpose and the fundamental principle of its operation is a feedback controller. It's trying to keep you in a state that's 
a good state. So fed, warm, not in danger, um, et cetera. And, and so <clears throat> it's the keeping, maintaining a particular desirable state, which is the whole point of having a brain. Um, and that's not the case for a computer, right? A computer does not have a desired input. It doesn't, a computer is not trying to get the human to type something on the keyboard or click something on the screen. Uh, the computer isn't, doesn't have an internal purpose which it's trying to achieve through its output. It's not trying to get us to do something. Uh, it's, it's the other way around. We are uh, controlling the computer. Um, and again, and we, um, the user, are a, a control system, not an input output system. And so, I, and I think, you know, and, and one can say, you know, I don't think anyone can really disagree with that, right? I mean, obviously everybody recognizes, yes, of course, that's, that's, that's what we do, right? We do things in order to achieve purposes like obtain food, um, obtain safety. Uh, so nobody disagrees with that, <clears throat> but, but often what people will say, well, it's just a type, uh, uh, it's just a slightly more specific type of an of a information process. A control system is a information processing system. It's just a special case. Um, but I would say it's a very useful to say, to, to focus on that special case, right? Because rather than considering all possible information processing systems, um, we can focus on the specific type of information processing system that actually does um, achieve um, control over some desirable states. And that reduces the search space of various possibilities and theories that we should be considering. It's not about um, all possible trans information transformation systems. It's about those that happen to accomplish things in the world that we're in. Um, those are the, those are better analogies for what the brain is doing, I think. Um, and again, I don't think anyone really, I don't think anyone actually disagrees with that. Um, and I, very often I ask people, um, with whom, you know, maybe, maybe they'll disagree a lot of things that I'll say. And, and when I say that, you know, so, so I, I often say, you know, there's, there's two claims. One claim that I would make is that the brain is not an information processing system. It's a control system, which, which gives you a more specific problem um, that is, uh, you know, has different sort of um, measures of success. Um, and they're very straightforward measures of success in the case of a control system. It's very easy to define what it is it should do as opposed to just an open-ended input-output system. Um, and I, so I don't think that claim is, um, is controversial at all. Um, and I think, again, most people when, when pushed will, will agree with that. But I think that what people, um, even though they agree with that, they proceed as though, uh, let's treat it as an information processing system. Let's, let's measure the inputs and let's, uh, let's control the inputs and measure the outputs. Uh, and measure the outputs along the way, uh, the little the stages of processing along the way by let's say recording in the brain, um, <clears throat> and so they treat it like an information transmission system from inputs to outputs. And I think there's a there's there's a couple of reasons for it, and one of them is is just the experimental method. It's you you kind of want to control things. You want to have a a controlled input, and you want to see what the output is at the end and that way you're doing a controlled experiment as opposed to letting an animal just run around like crazy and decide on its own what it wants to accomplish and then you can't make sense of it because it didn't do it didn't choose to do the right experiment right so you want to be in control of the experiment and therefore um get good data um and, and i would say that's that's not a problem it's not a problem for the, for the experimental method to be that way but we shouldn't we shouldn't then mistake the method for our theory, right? The, the, we shouldn't forget that that's just what we do in the lab. Uh, that doesn't mean that the brain is really, uh, you know, evolved uh, in the context of a laboratory experiment. It's not a machine for doing this experiment. It's a machine for doing very, very different things out in the real world 
Um, and we should come up with experiments that are controlled, but that actually address those things that the animal does in the real world. Um, so it's not about, you know, doing the same task, you know, 10,000 times and optimizing some uh, measure of success that we define in the lab, um, because animals have their own measures of success that are quite different. Um, so that's one reason I think why people do take this input output view. The other reason I think is uh, sort of an engineering view um, that if you have a system, if, we have a, if you have a black box and you don't know what's inside, what engineers will do is they'll, they'll send an input and they'll observe the output. And it's a way of probing uh, what's in the system. Um, and you can do this with all kinds of sophisticated ways to derive what the transfer function is. Um, and so we think that, again, it's, it's, it's um, treating the system in this kind of input-output way um, as a way of, as a strategy of uh, inferring it, inferring what the internal transfer function is. But if that's your method, then the on only model you will produce by that method is a transfer function that takes inputs to outputs. And again, the thing that's missing in all of these kinds of experiments is the fact that an animal in the natural world is actually um, dynamically coupled with the world in, in a kind of a circular way. So it does something, but then you don't restart the trial and you do a new trial with a new stimulus, like in a lab. No, it does something that produces a new input and it continues to do things that affect that input. And it's essentially controlling what the input is from moment to moment in such a way that the input is veering away from saying you're about to be eaten and or it's veering away from you're freezing or you're hungry and it's moving towards states that are saying you're well fed you're safe and you're warm um, and again and and because the experiment breaks that loop for good experimental reasons doesn't mean our theories should forget that other part of the loop, that sort of output to input. And, 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 and people have been saying this, people have been saying this forever. John Dewey said in, in 1896, uh, wrote um, essentially this point in a paper called the reflex arc concept in psychology, criticizing this idea of stimulus response uh, characterization of behavior. Not, not, not criticizing the, method, the experimental method, but ex, uh, criticizing the sort of the interpretation of the brain as an input output device. Uh, and again, and I, and again, I think no one can really disagree with his point. Uh, and I haven't met yet anyone who will deny that fact that animals are producing outputs to in, influence their inputs. Um, but then the question becomes, well, okay, well, what do you do? Where do you go from there? Um, and, and that's where I would make another, a second claim, which I think is much more controversial. So my first claim is it's not an information process system, it's a control system. Uh, my second claim is that accepting the first claim changes everything. Uh, it means once you actually accept and take seriously that first claim, which I think everyone does, but if you really follow through on that, it changes the, the kind of architectures that we, uh, we want to think about in terms of what the brain is doing. So it's, it's not going to be about encoding um, information about the world. Even though that may happen along the way here and there, it's not really the, the purpose. It's the, the brain is not going to be um, well described as a system that whose goal is to do things like that, like encode knowledge about the world. No, it's, it first and foremost has to control the world. And insofar as it may be useful to have some information about the world, it will do that. But, um, but the encoding of information about the world is not, um, is not a good definition. So now, rather than thinking about, so now it, it sort of changes the, 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 our idea of the processing from a kind of a serial, let's first take information from the world, represent it, build a model of it. Second, now use that model 
to uh, make plans, perhaps make decisions, encode or retrieve memories. And then once uh, that is complete, now you have a plan. Now you must transform the plan into a series of, um, into some motor program that accomplishes the plan. Um, whereas in fact, uh, so, so that's sort of the information processing way. We break up the problem and we have some group of scientists that study this first transformation we call perception. Then we have another group of scientists that study the cognitive aspects of maybe memory, um, maybe decision-making uh, that having been given a model of the world, they make decisions about what to do in the world. And then you have another group of people, motor control people who study how you turn that plan into um, muscular contraction. Um, but I, I don't think that breakdown works, that in fact, if you think about it as a control system, uh, then what you actually have is, is um, sort of sensory motor control loops. And, and that is closer to the way the nervous system appears to be organized. Um, and so it's circuits, it's circuits all the way um, through, the, through the environment even. Um, and it's, it, it's very challenging, but I think ultimately that's, um, that's the reality. I, I can get into that, but I just wanna make this sort of general point that it changes the way you organize. Um, and even, even how you define yourself as a scientist. I, I don't think it's good to just, uh, I'm just going to do um, this particular stage of transduction um, because you'll miss, you'll miss the, the, the picture. Uh, of course, trying to do the whole loop is also very hard because in, for many behaviors, it's extremely, um, it's extremely complicated. Um, yeah. Actually, if you can elaborate this point uh, of the uh, of brain being um, a control system, Maybe here we can take another analogy which uh, Jeff, Jeff Hawkins uses in his uh, book, uh, mm -hmm. a, a Thousand Brains, which we'll talk about later. But uh, he talks about this coffee mug that uh, if it is hot and if he needs to feel it and, you know, like how uh, he needs to touch the mug and uh, feel and how the information is processed, processed there. So if we take, uh, let's say, um, here two, two uh, sort of... Uh, specimens kind of thing that like w one thing is that the human with a brain is touching this coffee mug which is probably hot and uh, the other thing is a robot uh, which is this uh, input output based system is touching the coffee mug and trying to process the information so what will be a sort of difference in their experience Hmm, I don't know. I don't, I haven't thought about this example. Um, I, I guess from the perspective of, um, you know, control versus information processing, one could say that in, in, in one case, um, you, you have, you process the information to determine the temperature of a, of a cup uh, and to build some kind of a, uh, a internal measure of the temperature, um, and maybe that's maybe that's something one one does. But I think from a control uh, perspective, the question often is, um, do you want to drink this coffee? Um, and so, um, you know, if it's too hot, you don't want to drink it. Um, you don't maybe don't even want to pick up the coffee cup. And so that now the measure that you want to obtain um, is, is more of a, a, really more of a categorical decision. Um, it's not what the temperature is. It's, is it too hot or is it not too hot? Um, and so it becomes a kind of more of a categorical decision like quantity that you want to obtain from the world. Uh, in part of your, as, as essentially part of a control system. So a control system for grasping and bringing the cup to the mouth somewhere along the way has a, um, has some uh, process that uh, looks for a, a temperature threshold of some sort. And, and so, you know, the, the, what you do with the information from the world is quite different. In that case, you don't care if it's, you know, if it's uh, 37.8 or 30, 
uh, 38.3. You don't care. It, that's fine. It, you just don't want it to be, you know, you don't want it to be 100. Um, so, so the, you know, it, what, what you do with the information from, from the world is very different when you take this perspective. It's a little bit like an, another example I would give. I don't, I don't know about coffee cup. One, one thing I want to say about coffee cups is that um, if, you, if you look at conferences on motor control, 98% of the talks seem to be about coffee cups, pick, how we pick up coffee cups. And I've done this myself. I, I, I introduced my talk, how do you pick up a coffee cup? Makes, it makes it look like motor control scientists are complete uh, caffeine um, addicts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, it's like, but, but let's face it, that's not really the fundamental question that we maybe want to start with. Uh, but let me give you another example, and, and it has to do with uh, navigation. Um, one idea is that to navigate around the world, let's say you want to run through a forest because a tiger is chasing you. Um, and one idea is that as you run, you need to take snapshot information about the layout of objects, um, reconstruct in your brain a 3D model of where those objects are with respect to you and with respect to each other, then construct the escape route uh, and then implement that escape route. Um, and that's one possible way to build a system that runs away from a, from a predator. Um, and maybe even identify what those objects are. Is that a tree or is it a rock or is it something else, right? Um, so that's one way to do it. But another way to do it is um, do motion optic flow, essentially what it's called optic flow. So you just, um, from your visual input, uh, extract motion information. So where, what are the, the, the ways that objects are moving across the visual field? Um, and in that field of motion vectors, there'll be certain discontinuities. Um, so there'll be places where there's an edge uh, on one side of which motion is fast, and on the other side, motion is slower. And, and there's a discontinuity in that, right? Now that discontinuity arises uh, if it's on this part of the visual space. That continuity, this continuity will arise anytime there's an object uh, closer here and further there, which means that this edge is something you should avoid on this side. And that way you won't hit anything. Um, uh, if you go this way, then you're going to hit an object. That's, that's, that's going to impede your movement. And if you just do this, um, you will navigate around. So if you just find those motion edges um, and instate a policy of moving towards the side of the motion edge where the motion is slower, you will do a very good job at navigating among an arbitrary world of objects. And you don't care what those objects are. Um, you're just getting, you've got a tiger behind you. You've got more, th more things to worry about than whether it's a tree or a rock. And so the point is that once you have a task, <clears throat> a, 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 some kind of a real, real life or death, death, death task, um, or maybe not life or death, but a, a, a pragmatic thing to accomplish, then the information that you use from the world um, and that's useful towards that task uh, is much more clearly defined. Then you don't have to bother with all the other, other stuff. And, and let's face it, if you're running away from a tiger, if the tiger is using optic flow to chase you, you better use optic flow to get away from it or, or, or you'll be too slow. Um, not to mention, of course, foot placement and all that. But, but, but the point is that um, we wanna, and, I, and I, again, I emphasize what we wanna think about first are the tasks that are fundamental. Um, so, you know, aiming my finger at a computer keyboard is not really that fundamental um, for understanding the brain because that, you know, choosing letters to type on a, a computer keyboard is not what the brain evolved to do. Uh, you know, not most of its architecture is not really aimed at that kind of problem. Um, and, and again, now I'm not saying that we don't build internal models of our environment in a way which, which re resembles that first solution where you have some kind of an idea of where objects are around you. Um, I'm just saying that uh, we should consider what you really need to solve a particular problem. And that actually tells us often a lot more about what's going on in the brain.
because many animals really do navigate with optic flow uh, and they do just fine. Um, so this is, again, this is James Gibson's. Here, here I'm essentially channeling the, the work of James Gibson, who was a perceptual psychologist who emphasized um, that perception is not about just saying, okay, well, what's out there in the world and where is exactly and building some kind of an internal replica of the world inside the head. And he points out one, what would be the point? The world is already out there. Um, and second, that the information you need is actually not, not that. What you need is information like optic flow, like categorical perception of something is too big to, for me to jump over. Uh, it's not the height that I need to measure. It's a determination whether it's too big for me that I need to be sensitive to. Uh, and so it's this kind of thing, this kind of change of emphasis that he, uh, he made. So what, what's your um, analogy or uh, metaphor for brain? What do you think of it? Um... Well, a control system, um, uh, fundamentally. And, and I would say that that's actually, you know, really only um, in um, psychology and human neuroscience do people not already say that. I mean, if you look at ethologists or animal or, or comparative neuroscientists or people who study animal behavior or animal physiology. Um, they, they've, they all know that. They've been saying it for decades. Um, and you know it really and people who study the autonomic nervous system, they, they already recognize. It's really just um, those of us um, who, who study the you know the, the brain and the central nervous system um, in to ask these psychological questions that that often don't don't recognize this um so you know and and i would i, I would claim that what the what the brain does it's a specialization of uh fundamental metabolic control so so you know the the, the basic element of all living things is sort of the metabolic control maintaining um you know a, a sort of a desirable state um, and that's the fundamental aspects of physiology are, are like that, um, whether at the cellular level or the organismic level. And I think what the nervous system is, is a type of physiology that just extends out of the body for at least a short time. Um, so behavior, you know, um, so, you know, it, one part of one type of metabolic control is, uh, control your nutrient state by synthesizing the right kinds of molecules uh, through physiological processes. But another aspect of maintaining nutrient state is go find food. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's, it's a, also a feedback control circuit, but it's a feedback control circuit within which the environment plays a role. Um, it's part of that loop. Um, in some cases, a very small part of the loop. In some cases, a very complex part of the loop. And I think what, what happens in, uh, in evolution is that the nervous system, um, because it's dealing with the control through the environment, has to deal with all those aspects of the environment that become relevant for that goal of control. And, and it's a really big task. And so for that reason, the nervous system has become so complicated and so elaborate because the, the task it's trying, it's dealing with is sort of endlessly expanding and becoming more and more complex. Um, so yeah, so I think my metaphor for the, uh, the nervous system is a, is a control system. Now, uh, you know, <clears throat> one thing people often say you know, when I say this, it's like, well, okay, but again, an information processing is a type of control system. And so it's doing information processing. So yes, okay, fine. There's this loop, but inside the loop, we still want to treat it like an information processing system. And I would say, well, okay, but again, and, and, and this is, and, and then I would do another analogy. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is a silly analogy, but, <clears throat> but, you know, one could say that a car is a machine for converting um, chemical energy into kinetic energy. Um, that's actually true. It actually does do that, right? 
Uh, and you could say, well, it's a device for converting chemical energy into kinetic energy. And we're gonna study it in that context. We're gonna look at the various stages of this conversion process. And, you know, so there's, there's the engine, um, you know, and there's, you know, there's the drive shaft and the, the wheels. Uh, these are just coordinate transformations of kinetic energy. Um, and, you know, none of that's wrong, right? But if you never, if you never think about beyond that one uh, metaphor, um, then I don't think you're going to have a very good picture of, of what the car is doing and why it has things like windshield wipers. Um, you could say, well, that's converting electrical energy into kinetic energy, but you know, it's just not going to make a hell of a lot of sense. And, and so we, we could launch into a, a study of cars from that perspective, but I don't think it's going to give us the right picture. I think we have to acknowledge that you know, a car is a car is a thing for moving people from place to place. And, and, and all of its other things, including the conversion of energy is just a means to that end. And likewise, I would say that in the case of the nervous system, it's all really about control and all the various um, information processing um, that may go on is really in, in the service of that control. And, and so again, here, the, the case of the optic flow example, uh, that you know, if, if, if we acknowledge that what it really needs to do is run through that forest away from that tiger, we, we have a different model of how it's gonna go about doing it. We're gonna build a different model that's gonna rely not just on good representations inside the brain, but it's gonna rely on the dependable aspects of external geometry that make that strategy work, that, that optic flow strategy works because that's just you know, basic facts of geometry which can be exploited by the system by having this relatively simplistic policy. Um, and so you know, if we ignore that, we're gonna come up with all kinds of, all kinds of unnecessarily um, complicated solutions that we will not then find in the brain. Um, or we may not at least find in the brain. Um, so again, that, that's, it's, it's that change of perspective which, which I think changes everything. Um, it's, it just changes the kinds of questions you ask, the kinds of models you build, the kinds of hypotheses you go about testing. So while changing that perspective, now um, uh, it's your work, which is, and, and your uh, especially recent papers um, that they, uh, support that neuroscience needs evolution, where you also talk about these uh, feedback loops and especially, so, so, so the one or the first question that I had um, is the, the fact that uh, these feedback loops are present in most of the life forms or all the life forms, right? Yeah. So what's, what's your comment on that? So how even like simpler organisms they are using these feedback uh, loops? Well, I think, um... The, the feedback loops to the environment work because the environment has certain regularities in it, right? There are certain, um, so you can think about the input output rules and the output input rules, right? In the control system. Um, and there are just certain things that you can rely on if you're an organism in our world, right? Like for example, if something is far away in front of you, moving forward brings it closer. You know, that's obviously true. It's a very reliable fact. And so if you build a control system that Im embeds and takes advantage of that fact, well, then you'll have a system for approaching things. Um, you know, um, one very fundamental thing, for example, is that all many, many animals, extremely simple animals do, is this kinds of, these kinds of foraging strategies where they um, move around, um, relatively um, uh, slowly if things are good or relatively locally if things are good. And if things are not so good, they make movements that are um, longer, they make longer bouts of a straight movement. Um, and that works because food is not uniformly distributed. And therefore, given the fact that food is not uniformly distributed, if you're in a place where it's not so good, then going to another place is likely to make it better, right? And so there's a, there's a sort of a, an exploitable feature of basic 
statistics of nutrient distribution that says, well, if you're not happy, um, go somewhere else. And um, that's, it's so simple. I think, you know, that evolution will discover, it will just stumble onto mechanisms that exploit that principle, that exploit that regularity. Um, and so I think a lot of what we have is animals, um, you know, evolution through uh, modifying ancestors is just stumbling onto these regularities and exploiting them better and better over time uh, 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 because they're out there, you know, Again, you know, there's certain aspects of, of geometry, you know, um, if you're in an aquatic environment, um, light tends to come from above. And so if you want to control your um, depth, um, you can use light cues. Um, gravity has a certain direction, and it's the same direction, always, you can count on that. Um, and so there's certain regularities that are just present that you can, that you can use to orient yourself. Uh, move yourself from the surface to the, the bottom at different times of the day. Um, and animals just, you know, by, by modifying randomly and they will stumble onto those solutions that actually work um, best, that exploit those regularities. Again, the optic flow would be another example, right? That's, that's a reliable aspect of geometry. Um, it's not surprising that you will uh, animals of all types will stumble onto that. Um, so anyway, so um, so that's uh, you know again, that, but the feedback again, the feedback loop concept is is you know has been there really as far as I've been able to track it back. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Democritus said it back in the 500 BC. Um, you know, it, it's it's that idea has been out there for a long time. I just think that. Um, and again, people study animals, it's, it's kind of standard. Um, I think it's just in psychology that we've thought about things differently. Um, and, I, and I think that's a mistake. I think in psychology, we thought about, well, there's this soul inside the head and that soul needs to um, gather information and, and think about decisions. Like, again, I think we've um, built our on, ontology, our right? our set of ideas about what is there to be explained um, by essentially introspecting a lot about adult humans, uh, thinking about abstract, ob abstract things. And, and I think it, once we think about animals, it, you, you, you realize that that's not really uh, what the brain's about. Yeah. Um, and um, when we are, maybe we can dissect a little bit more of this control system. So, uh, I mean, of course, uh, we can definitely say that as other things, other organs, brain is also a, a product of evolution. But yeah. when we are talking about the, the brain, it's, it's basically this neural system. There are uh, other components of it. And um, let's let's talk about the the evolution of these components um, maybe briefly. Uh, just, mm -hmm. So the first thing which I can think of is um, which is of course related to this uh, the the feedback loops is the neurotransmitters, right? That the fact that these small molecules, uh, small chemical molecules, they evolved, and uh, the even the simpler organisms they could use these. Uh, molecules to move and to hunt and to you know to, mm -hmm. to find more food etc so the so the question is that how does this or like when this evolution of the neurotransmitters especially uh, dopamine or serotonin uh, well i think like, um yeah so yeah so each, each one has a story um and i i don't i don't know all their stories um i can tell you some some intriguing uh, things I've, I've read. One idea, for example, about calcium signaling. Why is calcium um, used so much in, in signaling? And um, one proposal I've heard, not, I don't know how well established this, this is, but I found it compelling, is that in the early um, seas, um, uh, they were very high in calcium. And so the sudden influx of calcium into a cell uh, often meant damage to the cell. Um, and for that reason, um, for that reason, um, calcium responses to calcium influx um, became 
essentially a, def a, a kind of a, a warning signal initiating all kinds of repair actions. And so um, having um, receptors that through mechanical deflection open up a channel that allows calcium to inflow was a good way to, to, to then use the existing um, defense mechanisms like um, withdraw or, or escape um, in response to that signal. And then later, um, the mechanoreceptors would actually sort of, um, uh, you know, develop their own calcium in order to continue using that same system, uh, even once the seas, the calcium in the seas dropped, um, and simply because inheriting that that old mechanism. Um, but but I don't know. I don't know how how accurate um, that story is. I just. I found it intriguing. Um, serotonin is um, very old. It's older than neurons. And, and, and I must admit that, that I know, don't know the story of uh, serotonin uh, all that well, um, except that it has a very important role in nutrient balance. Um, and so mobile animals that um, were not able to synthesize their own uh, nutrients um, uh, Develop that as a signaling molecule. But again, to tell you the truth, there I, I I I'd probably want to do a little bit of uh, background reading. Uh, one that I've that I've thought about more is is dopamine. Um, so um, dopamine is often uh, in neuroscience uh, associated with reward um, and reward prediction errors, etc. Um, and, and and that may very well be a big part of its role. Um, particularly phasic bursts of dopamine that occur whenever you something good happens. Um, but there's a, another uh, dopamine signal, which is tonic, a sort of a tonic level of dopamine that uh, is much more uh, widespread in the animal kingdom, uh, although the molecules involved are sometimes a little bit different, um, octopamine in insects and mollusks and such. But, um, but one proposal, uh, which I find quite compelling is um, from Thomas Hills and others that dopamine was used as a kind of a signal um, governing your um, foraging behavior. So as I mentioned earlier, a good strategy for moving around is if things are not so good, uh, if things are good, stay local. If thing and just kind of move around and zoom around and absorb what you can. And if things are not so good, make a longer bout of movement to move yourself to another uh, location. Um, and, it, and it turns out that dopamine seems to be involved in governing those two uh, sort of modes of behavior, that the more dopamine you, you're, you have, the more you stay local. And when dopamine levels drop, you go uh, further. And this is something that's, again, extremely common across many, many different very diverse species. Uh, and so the proposal there is that dopamine is, is controlling that, um, that aspect. It's, some, it's somehow linked into your nutrient intake rate, such that when your nutrient intake rate is high, you have high dopamine and you stay local, which is what you want to do when your nutrient intake rate is high. Once your nutrient intake rate drops, dopamine drops, and that makes you make these longer term movements and find another place where maybe your nutrient rate intake will increase. So these, and this is before neurons really, um, although of course it, it, um, it uh, in most cases it's, it's in animals with ner nervous systems. Um, uh, but you know, and then the other thing I, I could say about neurotransmitters is that there's, there's really two kinds of, um, uh, well, at least two, kind, two major kinds of neural uh, communication in the nervous system. One is hormonal um, and one is synaptic. And uh, hormonal um, communication uh, was probably in many ways ancestral um, to nervous systems of, of very, very early multicellular animals. Um, and synaptic uh, was, was a, a kind of a special case in, in some parts of the nervous system, probably having to do with speed of transmission um, 
um, and specificity maybe of transmission. Uh, but the parts of the nervous system that dealt with hormonal uh, transmission um, were sort of the top level controller. They're the ones saying things are good, things are not so good. Um, a lot of, the, a lot of um, general organization of top level behavior like sleep wake cycle, um, feeding versus resting um, were governed by that. And then within those various behaviors like feeding um, or dealing with, with threats maybe, um, the, it was using synaptic. Uh, and that's still the case actually, because if you, if you look at um, you know, the hypothalamus, uh, it does a lot of its signaling through hormonal secretions. Uh, and it still is playing that high level role of governing sleep wake cycles, feeding rest, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's still playing sort of the high level role, but the rest, the other part of the nervous system, the synaptic um, communication system has uh, grown so much in part because it's dealing with, a, with that endlessly expanding problem of dealing with the external world and moving around and orienting itself, it, you know, it, um, the high level problem is actually easy, right? If you're tired, rest, that's easy. If you're hungry, find some food. Uh, and, but then the signal that tells the rest of the nervous system, go find some food, you know, that becomes, that becomes tough that the rest of the nervous system, uh, to satisfy that high level, uh, state, um, actually has to do some pretty complicated work. And so I, I think what we see now in the nervous system is, is a, a great elaboration, um, much, you know, much greater elaboration of that synaptic transmission uh, scheme than the hormonal uh, scheme, which has remained, of course, and also we got more sophisticated, but, but not to the same dramatic extent. As far as other, you know, I mean, again, every neurotransmitter has got its, got its own history and, and they are, they are related, um, you know, uh, they are families of, of neurotransmitters that, that diverged in evolution, just like species do. And, uh, but I, I can't say, I can't claim to be an expert on that. So I can't say too much. You, you probably know more about this than I do. Not really, but, um, Next question uh, that I have is the, uh, so the, so after that, let's say that, so, I mean, of course the neurotransmitters were already there, which are these chemical um, regulators. And then it comes to the um, evolution of neural system itself. The, the, the question there is that, um, cause at one point we can expect that the organisms that they, this different species that they are evolving and um, there is a competition in the environment itself, right? Yeah. Um, so, and so, so how much that had to do with the, uh, with the evolution of, uh, nervous system? Uh, well, a lot, I think, I mean, um, and this is why I think it's important to sort of, um, look at the actual, um, history of it. Um, so every, um, so, you know, this is, this is related to another point maybe that you, were, you wanted to raise later, but, uh, but I'll just jump in. Is, is the idea of um, what is it that evolution is actually accomplishing and, and how, how do we characterize evolution first? Um, and often people see evolution as nature's way of solving problems um, uh, through natural selection. Um, but, but it isn't really um, because nature and evolution don't identify the problem to be solved uh, and then go about seeking to solve it. Um, all, all they do, all that happens, right, is that a modification is made, uh, variations are made in a population of ancestors, um, and then natural selection will just favor um, the, the variations that happen to just do better. Uh, or solve a problem. And so there's never a, there's never a problem that's, that's defined um, to which evolution then seeks an answer. It's more like it just produces a bunch of answers and the ones that happen to fit some problem are the ones that become more common. Yeah, so the point is that um, what really determines um, what evolves 
is not so much the problems that are being solved, but rather the variations that are possible, that the variations that even enter into the game of evolution. Um, and, and, um, and that is very constrained because there's only so many things you can do with an ancestor. Um, there's only so many things you can try. Um, you can't just have mutations um, arbitrarily creating new animals. Um, you, you're always working within the constraints of a developmental process. So you can modify the developmental process in only a couple of, in only certain types of ways that will not screw it up completely. Um, so for example, a mutation, uh, and, and this has to do with the fact that the de developmental process is a stepwise recipe for creating something. Um, and if you change step one, even if it's really potentially fantastic to change step one, uh, the problem is it's gonna violate the assumptions of steps two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera, in such a way that we, even though it might have confer a great advantage, it's just gonna screw up the rest of development so much that the animal would just not be viable. And so certain paths are just closed um, and it's extremely unlikely for those paths to appear. Um, and so for that reason, we can't really comment about um, various stages of evolution until we know what the ancestor was. Um, and so for that reason, we kind of, we kind of need to um, think about it in, in a sequential way. Um, the second thing that's, that's really important is that um, it's pretty much impossible to predict what will happen um, in evolution, what, what animals will survive. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, 70 million years ago, if you looked at earth, you would not say the dinosaurs are gonna die out. Um, but it just so happened that a meteor hit, you know, and, and, and that's it, and that, that happened. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's, things happen um, and things unfold for certain reasons, um, but they're not predictable often. Um, second of all, they're not determinable. You don't know why, um, you know, you, you can't really say why um, things evolved a particular way. But the one thing you can do is you can reconstruct what actually did happen, right? You can go back and figure out what actually happened. And that's a lot easier. Um, and so, but again, you need to look at the history. So I don't think you could say, uh, evolution had to produce this thing because that's the nature of the problem it was trying to solve. Um, uh, whenever we do that, we, 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 we find that there's another way that nature did it in some invertebrate that nobody ever heard of or something. Um, and, and it's not because it's, it's the best solution for a specific defined problem that evolution found. Um, uh, and but it's much easier to then just say, okay, well, it went through these stages. Um, these things did actually happen. We don't know why, uh, but we can, we can see what the repercussions were. You know, um, The reason our brain is a certain way uh, is a product of that history. Um, and uh, again, I think only by knowing that history can we, can we say what it is. Uh, can, can we really make sense of what it's like? And, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, you can throw a bunch of stones up in the air and not even the best physicist is going to be able to predict to you where the stones will land and explain to you why the stones landed that way and not a different way. But once you do it, you can look at where they landed and that's trivial. You can see what happened. And it's, it's the same in evolution. Uh, we can look back and, and infer what actually happened um, because there is only one history for a given lineage. Um, but again, so that's why I, I, I emphasize so much on um, looking at the nervous system in this kind of from this kind of historical perspective, um, and uh, you know, acknowledging that evolution is, you know, kind of the blind watchmaker. You know, it stumbles onto amazing things, but not because it's heading towards that. It's not because it really wanted to build a human um, or even a monkey. Right. There, there was just things that happened at every point that happened to, we got lucky, you know, in a lot of those stages, we got lucky. Yeah, but then there is also, or there is always this um, thing, right, that the 
at least the phenotypes that they were advantageous in those environments, they survived. So the, yeah, the, the yeah there's certain, again, and this comes down to those regularities in the environment, right? There are certain things that, um, that hold in general and animals um, are much more likely to succeed if they respect those things and take advantage of them. Uh, so, you know, flying is really great uh, way, mode of locomotion, um, but it's extremely difficult. And there's certain things that certain aspects of that sort of motor sensory part of the loop that are that have to be respected if you're going to succeed in flying. Um, and it's, it's been accomplished several times, uh, but you always, have to, you always have to deal with the laws of physics. You know? So insects uh, beat their wings in a way that has some similarity with the way that um, birds beat their wings and some similarity with the way uh, bats do it. Um, and yes, and it's because there are these um, basic fundamental constraints of physics that if you don't overcome them, you're not going to fly. Um, but again, to understand the, the to understand the solution, uh, that's not enough. We need to know the the to understand the mechanism um, that the different animals um, use to do that. Um, we do actually need to understand what it is they had to work with to accomplish it, because um, it is different um, in those cases. Can we talk about the advantages of certain process during the course of evolution, or we are always looking for um, so, sort of, you know, this building layers on on top of the, the? Yeah, I think we can. I think we can because if I think if we if we have an idea of of an ancestor. Um, and then we have an idea of what that ancestor diverged into. And it's always good, better not to just look along a single lineage, but always look at divergences, right? So uh, there was a certain ancestor that gave rise to two lineages, which we can still find today. And those lineages did things slightly differently. Um, then I think at every stage, it might be useful to say, well, why did these two lineages, um, what was the advantage um, that they stumbled onto um, uh, that others might not have and we might not see them. Um, we might also say though that some of them got trapped in bad and in, in, in dead ends when, and despite, despite that fact still survived. Um, so that's all often true as well. So I think we can talk about it in, in particular transitions. I, I think if we focus on particular transitions in the, in, in the evolutionary history, um, and then we can ask these kinds of questions. Um, but I don't think you'd want to do it. You don't, you don't want to jump too many steps. Um, you know, we have data about various transitions, or we can infer what they were by looking at um, living animals and looking at fossils and looking at development, that where we can reconstruct enough at what, what was the change and then we can talk about why it was good. So the cerebellum, I think, is a nice example. Um, there are, um, you know, approximately sixty thousand species of vertebrates with a cerebellum, and about a hundred without. Um, and they split off in two branches: the cyclostomes, which is lamprey and hagfish, and the nathostomes, which is everyone else that's still around. Um, the nathostomes have the cerebellum. Now, it could just be that the cyclostomes were unlucky and most of them died off. Um, but I think we can we can say something about what the what this um, and, and the, the, the cyclostomes have something like the cerebellum, and therefore the ancestor, the common ancestor, probably did um, certain structures in their hindbrain, uh, certain organization. Um, that has many similarities, but there's something really dramatic that happens with this enlarged cerebellum of nathostomes, the jawed vertebrates. Um, and we, could, we can say, well, okay, what could it be? Well, um, if theories about the cerebellum suggesting that it's kind of an adaptive filter that allows you to not just um, 
the process essentially to identify uh, the repercussions of your own actions uh, and predict the sensory consequence of your own action. Uh, that allows you to um, both uh, filter out from your sensory input the part of it that's just due to your own action and therefore um, discover more, detect more easily the things that are due to something else in the world like a prey. Um, but also you can preemptively correct for the errors or the you know, downside of your own actions. Um, and you know, originally, and this is shared again by all, all vertebrates, including the cyclostomes, is eye move. You know, if you're undulating from side to side, you're going to screw up your vision because your head is going back and forth. And so if you counter-rotate your eyes, you will stabilize the image. And so all, all the vertebrates stumbled onto that. Um, but the jawed vertebrates took it, took it many steps further to be able to more, uh, have a more refined and more sophisticated prediction of sensory consequences. And you, what you see uh, is that they got bigger. Um, uh, you know, that you have, not right away, but ultimately they became much larger. And, and I, th I think, uh, and again, I'm, I'm mostly, you know, just repeating what others have said who I've read, is um, it's because that overcomes certain problems. Once, once, you know, once you have a big body, you've got momentum to deal with. You've got uh, transmission delays to deal with. And so you cannot really make a big body. But now if you have this system here that you can use to predict consequences of your own um, actions uh, ahead of time, now you can overcome all those, uh, all those challenges. And now the, a, a path is opened up to you where you can make a larger body uh, that's a better predator. And, and next thing you know, we have, you know, we have 70 ton sharks floating around, gobbling up everything and, and, and doing really well. And I think, you know, I think part of the success of vertebrates in that, in those days was this, uh, structure that, that appeared, appeared around that time. It's about half a billion years ago. And I think it, you know, um, thanks to them, we are, we're, you know, we survived. Um, so that's an example of a transition, I think. Um, then there's a major niche. So that's a transition due to, I think, a, um, an innovation, a neural innovation. But then there's, of course, transitions that are niche transitions, right? Getting out on land was, was a huge, huge transition uh, that was very difficult. It, it took a lot of uh, innovation, just not just for breathing, but also for like body support. Um, but it opened up a whole new world of that was relatively, um, relatively benign, at least at first, because the seas were teeming with predators, but the land was mostly just insects. Um, and so getting out on land, suddenly there's this, there's this whole new world opening up, um, and opening up really dramatic opportunities, um, vision, for example in air is just so much better than on, on underwater. And that changes, that changes so much of what you can do, how you can navigate, for example. Uh, it's not olfactory, it's, it's more visual now and more, more robust in many ways. And so, you know, that's a major transition. Um, there, there, there are specific cases, but I, I don't think we can just say, you know, again, we can't just say, let's just, forget all that detail and just say, well, what does evolution need to produce in order to, what, what does evolution need to do to solve the problem of, of behavior? And that's not gonna lead us to the human brain because the human brain is a, is a product of those specific transitions that we went through. Um, you know, we have a large cerebral cortex probably because we were nocturnal for 200 million years. And so the part of our brain that had to deal with that expanded and then later became the cerebral cortex. It's not because it's such a great structure necessarily, uh, but we, we had to elaborate that thing because we, we, we were dealing with a different niche and, and then coming out of that niche had its own, uh, had its own uh, repercussions as well. So again, it's, it's, all, it's all these key chapters in history um, that hopefully I think we can reconstruct to some extent.
Yeah, and when we say that there uh, these transitions are happening, um, does this mean that somehow the, the, there was like kind of copy paste of the, the, the stuff that we had? So for example, um, neocortex or cortex is thought in a way of this cortical columns, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we say that, that there was expansion of the brain, um, does this mean that there was just like, you know, these somehow uh, the similar copies, they were again. Uh, re yeah, so the, there's expansion. The brain happens a lot. Um, and uh, there, it, yeah, so there's a couple of things that, that seem to make the cerebral cortex uh, very special. One is it's, it's, it's got these layers and one it's got these columns. Um, so it, it turns out layers is, is quite common. Um, so again, the cerebellum, it, it, when structures expand, according to Streeter, Georg Streeter, uh, when structures expand in evolution, often they become um, arranged into layers, probably because not becoming arranged into layers makes it difficult to expand. Whereas once you have layers, it, there's some, something about uh, the topology that's less costly, perhaps. I, I, don't, I don't know the there's probably energetic and a, and a sort of connectional argument for, for saying why that should be the case. But, but it, it appears to be the case that structures, as they become big, they very often become layered. Uh, and the cerebral cortex is not unique in, in this sense at all. Um, it grows out of um, what's called the pallium, which uh, also includes many other structures, including the hippocampus, et cetera, all of which are layered. And they were probably layered into three layers way back in the Cambrian, um, uh, again, before the split of cyclostomes and nathostomes. So all vertebrates essentially have that pallium, which uh, a, a, appeared to have had that pallium that's organized in these three, three layers. Uh, in our case, the three layers um, uh, diversified uh, a bit and probably for important reasons. But again, it, that's probably not um, the most important thing. The thing that, that is uh, quite unusual about the mammalian neocortex is that inside out development um, where layer, the deepest layer actually develops first, then the next, the cells that form the next layer migrate out and then so on. It's sort of an out, inside out developmental process. And that's quite unusual. Other parts of the pallium are not like that. They all build the upper layer first and then the lower layers. And um, we don't know when that happened. It happened sometime since we split off from reptiles and birds and before, so that's, that's probably about, I don't know, 200, 250,000 years, 250 million years. Uh, and then at least and it was done by the time we split off from monotremes. Um, so like the platypus, and that was probably 150 million years or so. I, I, might, I might be getting the numbers wrong. But anyway, it happened at some, some time there. Um, and I think, um, I don't know how solid <laughs> this idea is, that one of the things that's also unusual about the cerebral cortex is that the projections from the thalamus that, that bring the sensory information to the cerebral cortex go through this kind of um, columnar arrangement so that they, uh, they, they go from the bottom layer and then they traverse up through all the layers. And that's not the case for uh, most of these other systems, including the ones in birds and reptiles, where the projections from the thalamus go uh, tangentially across the surface. And if you think about, if you have, you know, and why it ha happened that way, it could have been completely just random, right? Maybe our, our brains became very small when we, when we split off from brains and reptiles, because, you know, the reptiles were stomping around giant dinosaurs, and we were these little creatures hiding in the dark, very, very, very small. Um, and so perhaps uh, our, our um, develop, development of the nervous system of the cerebral cortex just inverted happenstance. Uh, but the advantage of that is that if you have this kind of radio projection, now you can expand this thing without any real major wiring costs. Um, so you can have, if you have these columns, you can just 
blow this thing up and you just have lots and lots of columns. But if you have these radial pathways that have to traverse across it, then if you stretch it, make it bigger, then to get to here, you have to have all these cables that go along the whole thing. And pretty, pretty soon, um, uh, the, you know, the majority of your connections are gonna, the majority of your mass of the cortex is gonna be these connections that have to go across and reach all those distant regions. And so I think for these um, tangential uh, receiving type um, brain regions, they just would not be able to grow as large. Uh, they were sort of constrained. It's a little bit like one of those constraints that the cerebellum overcame, right? There's, there's certain repercussions of things and maybe completely happenstance, but, but the advantage of it is now new things become, become possible. And so with this radial projections, that the thing with the radial projections can grow like crazy, and which is what it did. Whereas the things without radial projections, maybe it would be great to have a gigantic, a much bigger um, hippocampus, a much bigger piriform cortex. Uh, and maybe birds and reptiles would be better off with much bigger uh, pallial systems. But maybe it's just not really, it doesn't enter into the nat game of natural selection because it's too hard to, to build it. Um, anyway, this is an example where I'm probably getting into way too many minutia and details, but but it, it at least gives a picture um, that there are certain things that happened in our past that might have had repercussions that uh, may not have been for the reasons that it was, you know, it's, it's not like it happened because it, we needed to have larger brains to do more computational power or something. It might have happened simply because we wanted to make smaller brains and then things just got inverted. And then only hundred million years later did the value of that kind of silly mutation actually pay off. Um, it'd be kind of good to, frankly, I'd like to talk to somebody that actually does uh, these developmental studies to, 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 to know a little bit more about this, because I think it's an intriguing idea. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, that this is really interesting that the uh, topology changes during the uh, course of evolution, but what I'm trying to understand is that, is there any data which shows, for example, that the composition in these cortical column, uh, columns changes? For example, um, in, in general, that there are uh, different cells apart from neurons, uh, glial cells. And yeah. that, do we see that uh, maybe certain parts are more dense and uh, in, in terms of neurons and less glial cells or vice versa? Um, is there any data on that? Um, yeah, there, there is, but you know, I don't know that data. Um, I do know a little bit about um, Schwann cells appearing again as animals got bigger. So you get myelin in, in the jawed vertebrate branch. Uh, regarding the cortex in mammals, um, yes, I believe you're right but I actually don't know what the, what the facts are there. I mean, the one thing that is um, clear is that there is a, uh, there are gradients in terms of uh, the kinds of layers that you get. Um, and many of the, um, so, so a lot of the neocortex, the six layered neocortex, that is the major uh, part of the human brain uh, has these six layers with, with a layer four, with lots of these sort of granular layer four, with lots of uh, cells that receive um, uh, input from the thalamus, sort of primary sensory in input. Um, but there's a gradient where the granular layer um, gets weaker and weaker and, become, and disappears as you go out to the edges of the cortex, uh, which are more similar to some of that more primordial uh, cortex. So there's, there's these kinds of gradients. I wouldn't be surprised if glial cells uh, have gradients that, that um, are sort of parallel to that, where there is a, um, there's, there's gradients of glial cells that again um, are different in the highly granular six layer cortex versus the agranular um, cortex that doesn't really have that layer four. So, yeah, I, but again, I'm not the one to ask about that. Um, that is not really my, uh, my expertise. And th this is one of those things that we will probably all be kicking ourselves, um, you know, decades from now is, is, you know, 
focusing so much on neurons and not enough on glia because uh, the more people study glia, the more we realize just how important they are. Um, and there is an evolutionary story for the different glial cell types that um, I just don't know it because I'm one of those people that has been focusing on the neurons. Yeah, um, one of the one of the thing again that if we go now a little bit more deeper and uh, talk about topology um, means like changing in somehow in genomics to the phenotypes itself. I mean, mm -hmm. since we see that there are new phenotypes being introduced, um, so so do do we see something like uh, so or drastic changes in topology or does it stay? Uh, quite similar? Um, well, it really does actually stay pretty similar. It's actually quite amazing. Um, when, when the more we learn, the older things turn out to be. Uh, so, you know, people used to think cerebral cortex was neocortex, uh, but, it, but it's much older. Um, people used to think that certain structures subcortical structures appeared at certain points. And in most cases, whenever we revise our understanding of when things happen, it turns out to be older than we thought. Um, there are studies in lamprey, again, jawless vertebrates, that um, strikingly show just how much of the basic topology is the same as, as what we see in mammals. And it's, um, you know, we don't know, maybe it's because they, stumbled onto their same solutions in the half billion years since we diverged from them. But it's pretty uh, hard to believe that, that they would, uh, in part because they've stayed in the same niche pretty much for at least 350 million years from the fossil record. It looks like they've essentially been around and haven't really changed so much. Whereas we you know, got out on land, we became nocturnal, we went into trees, became diurnal, got back off the trees. I mean, we went through so many twists and turns, uh, you'd think they would not have necessarily stumbled onto the same kinds of innovations we have. And yet a lot of the things are there. Now, not everything, there are, there are certain things that aren't. And those are the things that I think we want to investigate. Why you know, why are there certain things in mammals that don't exist in other animals or in primates, for example? And that could be at any level. It could be level of whole brain structures, um, particular connection patterns, um, uh, or neurotransmitters or cell types. Um, and so that, I think that's worth looking at. But I think the overwhelming topology, the, the general topology is, is actually almost almost embarrassingly similar. It's like, you know, it's like at the root of vertebrates, a lot of innovation has happened and not a hell of a lot since then. It's almost like the, the, the plan of early vertebrates has just worked out really well and adapted to all these niche transitions um, uh, with, with some pretty important changes, mind you, and certainly enlargements. But uh, topologically, remarkably, many of the things are still there that, that are very similar. Um, and maybe it's not because it's so good, but because once you have it, you can't change it. It's so hard to change it because once you change it in one generation that, you know, in one, you know, branch, it's just going to get devoured. Uh, you can't afford to mess with it, um, because the repercussions are too, too, too bad. Um, anyway, um, um, uh, one, one thing I, I did want to talk talk about, uh, maybe you were planning to do this later, but I, I do want to talk about the, uh, the other value of, um, you know, sort of a more general, I think, um, sort of uh, suggestion or, 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 or claim that I want to, I want to make um, about why it's so useful to look at evolution. And it's a much more philosophical point. It's not so much about neuroscience, it's much more about psychology. Um, and I think um, what it is, is, um, is um, how, do, how do we go about um, doing science and, and um, how do we in part um, define the problems that we address scientifically? Um, and 
one of the uh, big challenges, of course, is how do you define the problem of the thing you want to study? Um, and I actually think that that's, that's a real um, a weakness in uh, the scientific method um, is, that, um, is that we have to define the thing before we can formulate hypotheses. Um, and, it's, and it's very difficult to, to define the thing that we want to make our hypothesis about. Um, and I think this is particularly difficult in um, brain-related sciences because we have so many preconceived notions about what the things to be explained are. Um, so I, I want to uh, here sort of give the example of decision-making, right? Suppose you're a student and you go to, you know, you start your undergrad in psychology or neuroscience or something, and you say, I really, what I really want to study is decision-making. Um, and, and so you, or, or you're a scientist, you know, you're a scientist and you say, I want to study decision. And the, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to define what is decision-making, what is not decision-making. So certain things are, and then certain things aren't. And you're going to fine tune your definition until it you know, includes certain things, but excludes others. So things like um, cost benefit analysis seems to be belong inside the thing that's called decision-making, but, um, blood pressure, maybe not, okay? Um, or um, the reflex loop, the spinal reflex, maybe not, all right? Maybe we'll just say, okay, those things should not be part of the definition, cost-benefit analysis shoes. And then, and then, and then we, we find, we, we refine our definition until it satisfies our intuition about what it is that we mean when we say, I wanna understand decision-making. Um, and, I think you know we we have I think a good idea of what would be there. Um, certain things would not be there. Um, the brain mechanisms that accomplish these things we call decision making really do actually respect that same definition, whereby things like blood pressure and and the spinal uh, stretch reflex are not part of that system and cost benefit analysis is. Now, you know, where do we draw the border? And, and I think it's extremely difficult to draw that border, right? So for example, um, you know, and, and let me make an, a, a comparison with another concept. Let's say somebody else, a colleague wants to study attention. They don't wanna study decision-making, they wanna study attention. And so they define attention as a set of phenomena, um, you know, certain things we include inside the term that they are relevant and other things are not relevant uh, again presumably blood pressure and the stretch reflex are not relevant um, now the point is that those those uh, two uh, scientists will therefore start studying the brain and they will ask certain questions about the brain um, and set up certain kinds of experiments and they will um, you know in order in, in in the context of that term they've defined. Um, but then of course the problem is, again, what if it's not organized that way? So one thing that people studying decision-making will often say, well, you know, it's separate from motor control. Um, decision-making is, is part of the cognitive system. It's not about producing movement. It's about deciding which movement you want to produce. And so it occurs before the planning of movement and it occurs perhaps in separate, separate regions than are involved in planning the movement. Um, but then when people actually study decision-making in the lab, usually it's in the context of somebody pressing a button or an animal doing something. Uh, and where they see the decision uh, variables is often intermixed within the same systems that are used to control the movements. So the same systems that control a movement where there's no decision to be made also appear to be some ways implicated in, uh, in the process of deciding between movements. Um, so in the par particular region of the brain of the cerebral cortex, there's an area um, called LIP, which has been strongly implicated in decision-making. <clears throat> but it's also part of the system that moves the eyes. 
Um, and and so then now it becomes okay. Well, why you know that that's a mess. That why is this this thing that's supposed to be doing decision making also doing movement control? Um, ironically, that same region is also impl implicated in attentional phenomena. Um, and so essentially, what we have is we have um, a distinction in a conceptual distinction that overlaps in the brain. Um, and it, it looks like the brain doesn't make that same distinction. And, and now, and you know, in that particular case, um, three generations of scientists have now been arguing about what area LAP is doing, um, in part because one group is saying it's uh, representing the decision that's been made, the intention to do something. And other group is suggesting it's the attention that it's doing. And these things are considered different simply because of the way they've been defined. Attention is the thing that brings information into consciousness. Intention is sort of the output of a decision process that decides what your plan is. Um, and again, but maybe my, my point is that the terms um, are not mapping well. And lots of people have said this um, for decades. A lot of people have been saying that the terms that we have in psychology or that we define on the basis of our ideas about what the pieces are, that there should be some system for decision-making, for example, um, and a system for motor control, and they should be separate. These things are just not matching. Um, and, and I think that's a really big problem. That's a big problem for any science, but it's, but it's a particularly messy problem for sort of theoretical neuroscience, in part because we have such a strong tradition of ideas about what the pieces are from just our own introspection and philosophy about thinking about our own minds. Um, and so here's where I would say that, you know, I think a lot of people agree that the conceptual, um, sort of the conceptual toolbox is perhaps not well fit to the brain. Uh, but here's where I would say where evolution might actually really help us, right? Because, um, because if we acknowledge that we don't really know what the, the pieces are, what the distinctions are, um, I think we can pretty confidently um, say where they come from, right? The distinctions come from evolution, right? Evolution constructs a system that it specializes over time such that certain parts of that system specialize to do certain things that are not the same things that another part is doing. and and it specializes that way because these problems are difficult and you, you, know, you, you, you can't just have one solution that fits all. And so, so we know, so if we acknowledge that the, that what the pieces we've inherited uh, from psychological and really pre-psychological thinking don't fit, uh, they're probably not the correct distinctions. And we also acknowledge that the, whatever distinctions that are actually there, were produced by evolution, then I think the 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 conclusion is that we should we should look at we should look to those to defining those distinctions by looking at evolution. In other words, don't define the problem, um, and then you know, and and then um, try to find where it appeared. Let's say in evolution, but rather just go along the process and think about an animal trying to survive and dealing with pro encountering new problems as its nervous system is becoming more sophisticated and look for um, the, an emerging distinction, both in the level of a function that it might accomplish with that system and the actual neuroanatomical mechanisms that might accomplish that thing. So, you know, again, cerebellum appearing as a specialization of part of the hindbrain um, dealing with certain kinds of things, that's a distinction that's actually probably pretty meaningful um, and, um, and does actually fit with, with uh, neuroscience. So, so again, this is, you know, this is why I'm, I'm excited to do this, to, to be learning so much about evolution, is that I think it makes it easier to define what problem I actually want to uh, study. Uh, and, you know, even though I've been studying decision making, um, because that's what I set out to do, uh, I realized that 
I have to redefine the the task I set out to do in 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 very different ways. It's still addressing some of those things that interest me, um, but I shouldn't, you know, I I shouldn't think of it the same way I used to. Um, in fact, there are, you know, this there are many different decision systems, um, and they are associated with um, structures and functions that emerged at diff very different times in history. There are hypothalamic decisions that have been there for you know, 700 million years, long before any um, you know, uh, cortical decisions ever appeared. So, so they really, it, it, it helps one um, distinguish uh, different uh, kind of conceptual and philosophical questions. Um, in, in, a, in a way that's not, um, in a way that's actually clo essentially close to biology all the way through. That's the hope. Yeah, and this um, sort of refinement that uh, you are trying to uh, introduce to the field is, uh, so you call it phylogenetic ref refinement. And so uh, please introduce us to what is phylogenetic refinement and how we can use it to um, sort of um, define the, these different uh, things differently? Well, it's really just, I mean, all, all it really is, is, um, is applying the comparative method uh, to theoretical neuroscience. So the comparative method is what biologists do when they look at evolution, where they compare across species and knowing, um, for example, that um, birds and reptiles diverged from mammals more recently than sharks did. Um, if you see something that's common in sharks, birds, reptiles, and mammals, you can say that cerebellum, for example, that appeared early. Whereas if you find a structure that only appears or something changes about it only in uh, birds, reptiles, and mammals, but not sharks, then you can say, well, that's more recent. And so that method allows you to um, get an idea of a sequence of changes that happen in the nervous system. Um, now it's limited by the species that survived because uh, many branches died out. And so there are gaps in our knowledge. Like for example, between we split off from birds and reptiles, um, and then there was about, you know, 120 million years at least gap um, before we uh, we have again multiple branches that survive to this day, and so a lot happened in that 120 million years. Um, same thing at the root of the early vertebrates. Um, so there's there's gaps in it, but anyway, the point is that once once you have um, a knowledge, and it's not just anatomy, it's not just structures, it's also behavioral capacities um, and perhaps um, mechanisms, even neural mechanisms that you could actually infer by studying different animals. Um, if, you're, if you're able to uh, infer that certain animals in a wide group are able to do, have a structure that accomplished something and it's rather similar across all those creatures, uh, then you can sort of estimate when that structure appeared. And by doing that and constructing a sequence, now you can say something about what the history of stages across a certain, along a certain lineage of interest uh, was. And so if we're interested in humans, we want to follow along that lineage. And then the animals we want to study are those that split off from our lineage and then didn't change that much. Um, so uh, lamprey are good. Uh, because they split off and then they stayed apparently, at least as far as we can tell from, from fossils, um, they stayed pretty, pretty uh, stable. Sharks um, also, uh, you know, changed, of course, but not as dramatically as, as many other species. Um, uh, you know, birds are not actually as useful here because they split off, they and reptiles as a single group split off from us, um, but then birds did all kinds of amazing things on their own long after that. Um, so birds tell us a lot about uh, alternative solutions to similar things. And they actually stumbled on remarkably similar uh, things like warm bloodedness, 
bipedality, um, a very high energy lifestyle, etc. Um, but clearly separately from us, the last common ancestor was nothing like a mammal or a bird. Um, but anyway, once we have that sequence, so once we have that sequence, now we can kind of uh, try to reconstruct um, what the mechanisms were, right? If, you know, we're, we're not going to introduce a mechanism that um, relies on the existence of uh, a structure or a circuit that didn't exist at that time. So, so it, it gives us a, an additional source of constraints for building theories, right? Um, and, and I think that's actually where it's really, so there's two ways that it's useful. One is uh, like what I was saying before, um, it helps us define the problems, right? Because it tells us what the distinction, what, what are the distinctions that actually happen? You know, there was a specialization in, in the brain where this part of the brain really seemed to take on certain functions and this part of the brain really seemed to take on other functions. A very early distinction, for example, was in the pallium, which is part of that becomes the cerebral cortex. But anyway, there's a distinction between the medial part of the pallium and the rest. Okay, the medial part um, in all animals that have been studied, to my knowledge, is involved in navigation. In mammals, it's the hippocampus, plus a couple of other structures. Um, so it's it seems like you know there was an aspect of the brain that got involved with going and finding another spot, uh, navigating around the world, and this other part which includes all kinds of structures, which deals with a local environment. And that makes some sense, I think, that you'd have, because there's such different problems. There's one, one problem is dealing with the things you can see and the things you can interact with in a more immediate sense. And there's another problem saying, you know, I don't like my current environment. I wanna go over there because I know there's food over there. Or I know there's shelter over there. And then once I get there, I'm gonna deal with whatever's there using this, this local interaction system. And so it makes sense that this is a, very ancient distinction in the in the brain dealing with these functions. So that gives us now, you know, a distinction um, that of something to study. Um, you know, and you know, like I was saying, this decision making is not a good one because there's too many different types of decision making and they're overlapping with other things like attention and all kinds of weird ways that are not intuitive. But this one is probably a good one to say, here's a system for going somewhere else and a system for staying put. Um, and then, you know, and then we take it from there and, 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 and we continue to sort of refine you know, the phylogenetic refinement because you sort of build a phylogenetic tree, you try to figure out where different things happened. And then you sort of build your theory by having a, a model of a simple animal that becomes a model of a slightly more complex animal and so on at particular stages that represent these transitions. Like, now having a cerebellum or now having a medial pallium. Um, but it's very complicated because it's not just that. There's also interactions between the systems, um, new uses for the systems when you make a major uh, transition. There's also reduction. Um, and, and, and here again, for, for our story, um, we became nocturnal and we regressed certain aspects of our nervous system um, which are very prominent in fish and birds and reptiles, but not in us because we moved away. We gave up on vision for, for many millions of years. Not, not gave up completely, of course, but reduced our reliance on it. And so we, um, certain parts of our nervous system sort of degenerated. Um, and later when we developed the capacity, those similar capacities of relying more on vision, we didn't, we did it in a different way. Um, uh, using the, you know, whatever the ancestor had at that stage. So, so anyway, by, by arranging the innovations on the sequence, it gives us a picture of, first of all, what the distinctions are. Um, but second, it gives us some uh, constraints for what theories we, we want to um, propose. Um, so here, you know, as an example of that, I would, I would, um, sort of provide a, you know, a polite critique of, of the trend in, in a lot of neuroscience to, to seek optimal solutions. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, people interested in um, how the brain optimizes certain 
kinds of problems, for example, uh, reward rate maximization. And, and I've, I've done work on this too. Um, but um, what people often do is they say, well, let's define the problem and let's define a metric that says how optimal something is. And then we'll just assume that the brain having had all this time to evolve will have come up with some optimal solution and let's try to see what that might be. Um, but I would say that I don't think that's going to be the case because a lot of optimal solutions that might seem optimal now, the door was shut millions of years, millions of years ago, and and that's it. That we're, we we can't get to that solution anymore. Um, and so, um, in the space of all possible solutions to the problem, there are those that work and those that don't work. So those that don't work, okay, we can forget about those. Then there are those that work. Some work really well. Some work not so well. But I think those among the the, the solutions that are plausible and could work, some are evolutionarily impossible. And if they're evolutionarily impossible, I would say, well, we throw them out too, because even, even if they're beautiful, even if they're elegant, they're not evolutionarily, they're not compatible with what we, the data that we have from, the, from evolution. And, and it has to do with things like, again, you can't just redesign the system from scratch. There's no point at which you can just you know, throw the whole developmental schedule out and create a whole new animal um, because, because some new structure evolved. It, it's, it's not going to, that doesn't happen. There is no case, um, certainly that I've ever heard of, where, where you, you just redo the whole animal. There's always a developmental sequence and it's, remar and it's, and it's very conserved in part because it's so hard to, um, to mess with it. You just can't mess with it. The example I always give, um, is the eye. Um, now, the eye has evolved many times, but the eye that we have, uh, which evolved um, along our branch, <clears throat> is backwards. Um, so the, uh, you, 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 you know this probably, more, you know, that, that the receptors um, have little, the, the actual cells that, that are sensitive to, to light have these receptors. And the receptors are pointing backwards in the eyeball. And in front of the, the receptors is, the, is the, the receptor endings is the body of the cell. And then there's all kinds of other cells, glial cells, horizontal cells, et cetera, all kinds of um, bipolar ganglion cells, layers and layers of cells, plus the, all the wiring um, that's in, essentially blocking the light. And so light has to pass through all those layers of cells before it gets to those receptors. And, uh, and you have this organization in all vertebrates. Um, <clears throat> now you don't have it in cephalopods like octopi, and I'll come back to that. So now why would that be the case? Why would that be the case? So, so there's, there's been many proposals out there for why that, that could be the case. Maybe it's um, because it does some good filtering. Maybe all these cells actually help you filter the input in some way, or maybe it, it's protective. Um, but, but if you actually look at evolution, you, you see actually how the eye uh, evolved, and you can see this also by looking at development to some extent. Um, what happened is we actually had our receptors when we were when we were essentially spherical back in early uh, eumetazoans. We had the receptors uh, facing upward, um, out of the body. Um, but at uh, one stage along our evolution, um, we folded the part of the neural tube. Uh, sorry, we folded part of the surface where we had these uh, receptors into a neural tube. Um, and this is called neuralation. This is what builds the neural tube. And so those receptors were now trapped inside facing into um, a central canal. Uh, um, essentially, they, they were folded inside the body. Now, this wasn't a problem at all at that stage because these animals were microscopic. Um, and well, maybe not microscopic, but they were no, you know, no more than like a millimeter or two in size. And they were com pretty much completely transparent. And they, the only thing they really did with those visual receptors is do things like control circadian rhythms. So if there's a lot of light, you do one thing. If there's less light, you do something else. Um, maybe occasionally if a shadow appears, they would engage in some escape behavior. But anyway, the point is that once they folded inward, uh, they were trapped in that position. And it wasn't the problem. 
It would, the problem wouldn't be identified for millions of years, um, if at all. And then what happens is that neural tube bulged outward, sort of sprouted parts of it to the sides of the head, creating where uh, sort of patches uh, of um, light receptive light receptive patches that were then used for a slightly better navigation. But but the receptors are facing the wrong way. Those patches then curved into retinas, formed lenses, etc. Started to move around, but the receptors again were trapped that way, and there was just no way to flip them around without messing up the developmental program that constructs the eye. And and we're stuck with that. We're stuck with it. And even humans and hawks and cats and all these amazing, visually amazing animals have this ridiculous inverted retina. Uh, and cephalopods don't because they didn't have the neurulation stage, right? So cephalopods had this, this, they also evolved from those sort of spherical eumetazoans with the receptors pointing that way. But in their case, the things moved to the side and then they formed into eyes. Um, and so they, because they didn't go through this reversal step. But this is an example of a, a, a really a rather suboptimal um, arrangement. Uh, in the end, it's suboptimal. Yes, we got, we got by without it. We did, we did fine. I mean, uh, we got by with it and we survived and, and we're, we're amazing visually, um, but it's not optimal. It's, it's, a, it's a happenstance that, that happened. And, and, um, and there's a lot of that. There are a lot of things in our nervous system that just don't make any sense unless we know what some of those transitions were. Again, why do we have the visual system we have? A lot of it has to do with because for, for a long time, we actually gave up on a lot of the visual system we used to have, uh, regressed it, and then rediscovered it. Um, and the same goes for many other uh, central structures. Uh, you, you, can only do, um, you can only make do with what you have at every stage, and you can't jump ahead um, and just because it would be a good idea. Uh, and again, so the point is now by going through this, um, we have constraints that allow us to um, focus on our efforts on towards those uh, hypotheses that are more evolutionary plausible than others. And again, this is why I have a sort of a, always a, a sort of a reluctance um, to think about optimality so much because I think, um, yes, the nervous system evolution does improve animals, so they do get better, but they're so constrained by all that baggage that um, optimality will never give you the whole story. And in fact, it might give you a very misleading story. It might, it might lead you towards solutions that just really don't, you know, they, they just could, were never really available. Um, uh, when we are talking about uh, refinement, I, actually we can al already think um, how many times a brain evolved independently um, through the course of evolution. Yeah, well, at neurons, um, it looks like maybe neuron, a, a nervous system of some sort uh, perhaps evolved twice. Uh, now, of course, it could have been many more times and then just died off and we have no idea. But it, it looks like maybe twice. Um, so there's a branch of animals called tenophores or comb jellies um, that have a nervous system that used to, uh, it used to be believed that they were more closely related to us than sponges are. And sponges do not have a nervous system and does not, they do not appear to have ever had a nervous system. They do have some neurotransmitters and some elements, but they, nothing like you know, what we think of as nervous system, whereas comb jellies do. It's weird, uh, but now it turns out genetic analysis suggests that they are actually an earlier offshoot. Uh, and so in other words, interestingly, uh, it's almost like comb jellies came up with a nervous system on their own. Uh, and it has some similarities, uses some of the same neurotransmitters, but, but has also has some dramatic differences. Um, from ours. Um, and, and so I, I, think that's, I think that's rather cool. And also comb jellies are incredibly cool. Take a look at Wikipedia and see some videos. They're amazing. They're, they're cool animals because they're like an alien species. Uh, they're like something from outer space. Um, but anyway, along our lineage, um, uh, so this would be um, eumetazoans. Um, 
there the nervous system there's a single nervous system and then as far as brains it depends on how you define it um and and if you think about sort of a centralized um a single centralized center uh you know a, a system where you can make a distinction between central versus peripheral uh, then several times um in core dates in mollusks in arthropods so all insects um and oh uh, sorry some mollusks um and so a few times independently um and uh and then, so, you know, if you just now limit it to chordate brains, so the, now the chordate brains and the mollusks and arthropods are, um, are I actually have a lot of similarities, but, but they also have major organizational differences, uh, topolo some topological differences. But in terms of the genetics, they're, they're related. There's some, there's some patterning genes. Um, uh, but you know, there again, a lot of the um, a lot of the structures um, are essentially independently evolved, um, and they're interesting to study because it's again, it's like an alien species. Um, it it shares some of the fundamental pieces of just you know neurons and and hormones, and so that's, a lot of that stuff is there. Uh, but it kind of has its own history. Um, and if you look at ours, you know, once you get to core dates, there's something like a, a centralized brain. And, uh, and then it's always a, a kind of a tube-like structure. Um, so it's a tube where um, the bottom part, the inner, in the, the, it's a tube that runs along the sort of top part of the body. Uh, and the bottom part of the tube is more motor that upper part of the tube is more sensory. This is in general. The front of the tube is essentially the hypothalamus. Um, what in us is the hypothalamus and in other chordates is a hypothalamic-like structure. And then the rest of it is the spinal cord. So it's like a hypothalamus attached to the spinal cord. And then within each of those, you have some um, specializations and elaborations. And it turns out, you know, uh, our, whole forebrain cerebral cortex and all that is is really just part of that hype that front hypothalamic part of the neural tube um, that just uh, grew very much it got specialized um, so there's a certain topology and, and, and again so it depends how you define it you define it in terms of forebrain midbrain hindbrain well then it's chordates uh, if you define it in terms of a centralized central versus peripheral um, then I would, then I think a few times, um, and, and I don't know, I don't know so much about the other, other, um, lineages, but several times, um, but actually not, not as widespread as, as you might think. There's a lot of animals out there, um, you know, among very, various different branches of, of invertebrates that, that get by without it, without a brain. Although I must say that the ones that are most seem, seem to be the most um, impressive in their feats of behavior do all seem to have some. So, you know, the insects are pretty impressive. Uh, cephalopods are pretty amazing. Um, so, and they, they all have brains of some sort. Yeah, and the fact, for example, especially uh, cephalopods that they that these things that um, they have um, more neurons in their um, in the in, in their uh, arms, like for example in octopuses, than yeah. in their brain and, and this kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's actually it's actually a, a remarkable when you when you look at some of this these studies, you realize just how many variations there are that we're just you know, it, it nature always has some some surprise for us when, when we look, the deeper we look, you know, again, the comb jellies are a nice example. We thought we had, you know, we thought I had, we had a good idea of where the nervous system, what makes a nervous system. It turns out, well, you know, they, they came up with another one, um, you know, and yeah, and mollusks. I mean, you look, look at the, look at the, the movement, you know, we think of muscles contracting and moving bones around. They're doing it all with volume sort of, you know, playing with the, 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 uh, a, a volume control of a 
of an object of a uh, soft bodied object and it's a, just a different control strategy and it's incredibly sophisticated um and you know um if we ever find life on another planet i think it's just going to be amazing how how different uh these 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 things can be there's so many different ways of doing it um which is again why why i i'm so you know obsessed with looking at ev evolution because you know if we try to figure out from among all the possible ways of making a sophisticated behaving animal uh we're going to spend a lot of time with what is not actually relevant for our brain our brain is a particular you know a particular thing that ap appeared with a particular history and uh particular structures and doesn't necessarily have to be like that this makes me think about um, the size in general. I mean, of course, uh, we are quite proud of it that uh, we have the bigger brain in, the, in, in terms of number of neurons. Um, but then does it really, or like what really matters when we talk about uh, sophisticated control system? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, you look at, you look at uh, some animals that are pretty sophisticated, um, you know, we're sophisticated in the ways that matter to us. Um, I mean, you know, we do have a very large brain, um, but it's uh, in some ways it's a scaled up primate brain. Um, you know, primates have a particular topology that if you scale it up, it will have to have, a, for example, a very large cerebral cortex as opposed to other structures because of a high degree of connectivity and things like that. Um, so, but of course, scaling does scaling does matter i mean more does you know if more neurons you can do more with um but you know if you look at the cere cerebellum of um, certain fish it's it's massive um you know and you know you look at um well you look at our cerebellum it has half half the neurons in our brain our granule cells of the cerebellum you know they're they're you know it, it's not the cerebral cortex that actually really is is where all the you know, where all the cells are. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of data about relative size of brain structures. Uh, and that's, that's great because it's, and that's quite easy to uh, measure. And it's also something you can infer from uh, endocast. So, so looking at the brain case of fossils allows you to say how big that brain was you can't say anything about density, but you can say how big it was, and you can even distinguish, uh, at least for some species, different structures within that brain case. Um, so there's a lot of data on brain size, and I think that's that's uh, interesting. But I, I actually try to focus more on topology. Um, what are the connections? Um, because I think, again, functionally speaking, um, you know, size, of course, is important, but if you don't know the connections, then you don't know what to do with that size, right? So I think, um, you know, I want to know, for example, one question, for example, that I'm very curious about is um, in the human brain and the primate brain, in mammalian brains in general, there is a circuit that involves the cerebral cortex, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, back to the cerebral cortex. And there's an ongoing debate whether that circuit was a mammalian innovation or much older. And this is a question that's really important to me because if it's really old, then my, my development of the, of the theory will be a certain way. And if it's really new, then my theory needs to be able to develop to the point of, of sort of early tetrapods in a way that doesn't require that circuit that circuit can't be integral to the function of that early tetrapod and only might appear later to be, to be used for some functional reason. And so, um, you know, so again, topology, it's, it's not so much that the brains got bigger. It's that if they, if it's true as some claim that that is an innovation that appeared in early mammals sometime, then that affects how I would construct this theory differently than if it wasn't true. Um, so that kind of that kind of topological question is really important. Um, now, there's also um, 
topographical questions. So how the maps, what kind of maps are there? Um, uh, you know, visual versus auditory versus somatosensory, et cetera. Um, that's also another question that's, that's important. You know, did, uh, for example, um, amphibians, it seems to be pretty much multisensory information going into thalamus, just mixing together and just not, never really getting unmixed into specific regions that are just about vision or just about audition. Um, whereas in mammals, clearly there are specific regions. And so that's also a, a kind of an important topological question. So if, you know, what, what do you do with a brain that doesn't have, um, that doesn't have that kind of topology? Uh, retinotopy, for example. Um, you know, we uh, and many mammals have very nice maps of visual space in our brain uh, where you can, you can see, you know, that certain cells are sensitive to this part of space and the nearby cells to this part of space and so on and so on. And far away cells are to far away space that's more distant. So there's a kind of a map um, that does not so much hold for reptiles. So reptiles don't, at least not in their uh, forebrain uh, visual region. Um, not really, uh, at least to my knowledge, has not been found. There, there, there are projections. They, they do have some specificity, but it's nothing like like a, like the kind of map that we have. So that constrains what kind of visual processing you can you can uh, ascribe to that early ancestor. If if our in, early ancestor was more like them, uh, then uh, we then our theory of the early ancestor can't be one which relies on high resolution vision in in the forebrain. Um, which is not to say you you don't have high resolution vision elsewhere which they do in the tectum. It's a different, different part of the brain. But anyway, the point is if you're building a particular theory on what a region does, and you're talking about a stage of evolution, you wanna make it compatible with the data about okay. um, what, that, what that thing was like. Did it, have, did it have, for example, a detailed map? Did it have uh, a different regions specializing with different modalities like vision versus audition? Um, and that, that's the kind of thing I think it's useful to know. Again, because if we see a point where it diverges, now we have a new distinction. Now we can talk about a visual system separate from an auditory system, as opposed to an earlier thing, which might be just the, there's something scary, I must run away system, right? Which might've used both auditory or visual information. So- Auto business, um, yeah, I'm sorry. So how no, no, no. was this um, um, the, the classification of the regions is in the brain? How robust? The, the classification of the regions. Uh, well, for some species, we have a lot of data about it, right? So for some species, I think we do have um, really robust for, for primates and, and mammals in general. I think we have a really good uh, breakdown. Um, but other animals are really understudied. I think, uh, in particular, reptiles. I think we really need to uh, we really need to study rep more reptiles and certain reptiles more than others uh, that are more in sort of representative of that common ancestor. Um, now there are people who study reptiles, but it's just not the same. It's just not the same huge huge group. Like if if you look at all the people that study rodents, you know that's like. 90% of neuroscience probably. Um, but um, that gives us a very good view at one particular window. Uh, and it gives us a lot of insight at, into particular transitions, especially when we compare, let's say rodents to primates, but it doesn't tell us uh, others. Um, and that's where we need certain, uh, you know, that, so, so there are people who do this. I mean, Gilles Laurent, uh, has studied these animals and, and studied a wide variety of animals. And so his work is an example of, you know, I wish there was more of it, essentially, uh, people who do that kind of thing, where they really look at some of these, these species uh, in comparison to some of the more familiar ones. Um, and they really, they really provide the kind of information that I think we need to, um, to again, to, um, make better distinctions about what the pieces are conceptually and, and anatomically, but also um, 
help us reject theories that are not compatible with with evolution. Um, so yeah, so I you know more more shark work would be great. Um, more reptile work would be great. Um, certain certain mammals, um, certain primates, uh, and you know, but I I you know I'm I'm guilty of being one of the people that just does what everybody else does. Uh, you know, I study monkeys and humans, so that's I. But I read at least I, <laughs> at least I'm trying to read the people that do the other. Uh, the What's people. your uh, favorite models beyond uh, monkeys and humans? Um, well, lamprey, I must say, in part because of the people that have worked with lamprey have have done um, have really done a great job. Uh, particularly the work of Stan Grillner, his his whole lab has just um, first of all, it's a very good model species because it's a very early vertebrate and has not changed as much. Uh, so it gives us a good window into early vertebrates. Um, but also because of the quality of the work that they do. I mean, they really, they really dissect the animal in, in detail with all the most modern methods. Um, I wish people did that with uh, many other species, you know, applying the same kind of methodology, you know, track tracing, optogenetics, uh, you know, recording simultaneously in multiple regions and well-identified neurons where you know they project here and there. People are doing this kind of stuff in zebrafish too. Uh, so there's fantastic work in zebrafish. Um, zebrafish, however, are not as good a choice um, because like all teleost fish, which is the majority of fish, they went through a lot of weird changes in their brain uh, since they split off from us. So there are other fish that would probably be better uh, from an evolutionary standpoint to study than zebrafish. Uh, but then again, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are a window uh, maybe confusing window in some ways because of their their in sort of idiosyncratic innovations, uh, but yeah, some of that work. And then there's this creature called the Amphioxus, which uh, which is even older uh, branch um, than lamprey, probably about 600 or 650 million years ago that they branched off of us. And there's a lot of great work on that animal. That's a really that is a very valuable animal because it gives us a window into early core dates that again, for a number of reasons, there's good reasons to believe that they haven't changed so much in all that time. And so they give us that good window. Um, but then there's, you know, certain kinds of lizards, um, uh, amphibians, salamanders. Um, uh, then there's, uh, you know, in the mammal world, there's actually a lot of species. So in the primate, in the primate branch, we have a lot of species. And so people like Leah Krubitzer and um, Todd Pruce and other people that are looking at different primate species, they're, they're covering that part of the tree extremely well. So I think there's a lot of data there. Um, the, the real gaps are uh, elsewhere. You know, more shark work <laughs> would be great. Um, more reptile work would be great. Um, and then maybe, maybe some of those older branches like like light sheet microscopy and amphioxus would be fantastic because the amphioxus again is a is an early core date but it hasn't been studied at a level of actual neural activity to my knowledge so it's a lot of anatomy um but uh you know and chemistry and whatever but but to actually watch its behavior and and record um and you can do it because it's small and transparent and not endangered and so uh, that that would be fantastic uh and um, you know but a lot of people know this you know in fact that that animal's been been the center of attention for more than 100 years because people realized just what a valuable window it is um anyway i would love to have a lab that has all these creatures but it'd be really complicated it'd be hard to uh hard hard to deal with that um my, the vet would have a hard time with that Exactly. And to work with all the animals and also do a podcast and, you know, to read more about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, but it, it, this is, this is kind of like, you know, this is kind of like a, like a team effort. There are, there are people doing these things. They are people studying these things. Uh, I do think though, that they, um, that it would be good for neuroscience if we uh, encouraged more of that, because, um, you know, right now, 
everybody is getting into mice and, and not even rats, but mice because of the technique. So everybody's flocking to studying one animal because we can study it with all these techniques. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just that if everybody does it and nobody does anything else, that would not be so good, right? We need, we need to be able to do uh, other animals and other kinds of behavior. Um, and I think only then will we have a really good, good picture. Um, so I wish that, um, you know, there was a, again, Gilles Laurent wrote an article um, in which he showed the distribution of species studied in neuroscience over time. And he's showing it, you know, the picture is not, not that good. It's becoming less diverse. We're, we're, we have more people studying the same thing and fewer people studying diverse species. And that's, I think in principle, a really bad idea because we're just gonna miss so much of the picture. Uh, and, and, and I'm not saying that we should strive. I'm not saying it's because I wanna really know about octopus, let's say, or I really wanna know about some strange, you know, mole rat or something. No, it's, it's because uh, only then will we actually learn about our own lineage, I think. Only, only once we have that, that, that window, which will really allow us to, to do what, what a lot of biologists in other fields have already been doing, which is really comparing, uh, doing comparative work uh, and relying, you, letting evolution guide their theories. Um, uh, and I think we need to do that in neuroscience. There's no reason why we shouldn't do it in neuroscience. I mean, um, also the fact that we can uh, get certain answers faster that, you know, the, the theories that we are trying and the, especially in these simpler systems. So I also wanted to comment on uh, yeah. this one study where they, um, they, they tried to simulate the, um, the worm, the C. elegans, where they know mm. uh, more or less their, uh, it's, it's neural system. Yeah. Um, but it didn't move, right? Like uh, once they uh, stimulated it. Well, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about, you know, if, if I mean, what, the, 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 I think there needs to be a, a certain level of hypothesis, which isn't, if we know, every, the, the hypothesis shouldn't be a connectome plus knowledge of channel dynamics and Hodgkin Huxley, and, and then just connect it all together and say, all right, well, if we've got all the facts together, it should work. I just don't think we can have that level of precision at every scale to expect that kind of thing to work. It's like, it's like you know, it's trying to model the weather by, by taking a few measurements here and there. Um, I think, you know, or like, let's say, if we just knew the precise connection of every neuron in the brain, we should just be able to type it in and hit play, right? I mean, I don't, just don't think that's going to work. And, and apparently not even for a C. elegans. Um, I think we need to have a, some theories. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's the topology in the C. elegans that is probably much more necessary for its function than some other aspects of the connections, you know. Um, there, there's some core organization that matters. You know, there, there, there are plenty of models, let's say, of spinal cord undulatory swimming, which are, you know, really simplified, but they, they get the job done beautifully, right? Um, and, you know, okay, I, Eichspirt has developed models of, you know, just coupled oscillators uh, linked in a kind of a, a um, sort of serial pattern uh, with certain uh, trend like um, slower uh, at the front and faster at the back, um, intrinsic frequencies, and you you that you know you wire that up and you hit play and it undulates and it creates a motion that actually would push an animal through water. Um, but you, you do that by essentially. Um, distilling the more important aspects and not worrying about exactly how many calcium channels are in, in, in every dendrite of every, every cell along the way. I think that level of detail is going to mass, it, that level of detail could only work if you had it perfectly right. Um, and I think you're better off doing a, a kind of a, you know, 
build a hypothesis and build a model to express that hypothesis at the level that's necessary. Um, and maybe refine it if you find that it, it's not, it doesn't capture the behavior perfectly, right? Uh, so I don't know, I don't know about that. I, I think we don't wanna jump over, um, we don't wanna jump over the sort of hypothesis level uh, and just say, let's just take data, implement it, wire it up and hit play. Um, because again, I don't think we can possibly have it perf well enough, uh, every detail to, to make it work. Yeah, and so what's your uh, comment on understanding or using evolution in understanding uh, the, the other properties, abstract properties that we are trying to understand like cognition? Yeah, that's, that's a, yeah, that's a tough one because, um, you know, there are, there are things that we do that uh, we're just way beyond any animal that we can find. Um, you know, uh, we don't have other human-like species anymore. And so the closest we have is chimps and they are pretty amazing, but, um, but you know, not at, at the things that we excel at, we're just way, way beyond that. And so I think, uh, no, I think there's, it's, it, there's, a, there's always a gap um, that an evolutionary approach uh, can't cross because of that. And it's about 7 million years between us and chimps. Um, and so, um, you know, I actually want, so, I'm, so, so anyway, I'm, write, I'm writing a book on all this and I'm not sure if I'm gonna actually discuss humans in the book. Uh, I, because it might be, it simply might be, you know, I think I would, I would have to pretend that I know something that I, that I don't, that I don't actually know. Um, so the, the point is that an evolution approach, I think, can, can work as long as we have the species that tell us something about that common ancestor that give us a sequence, right? Now, even further back, we're missing parts of the sequence. There's, there's many things that happen between, uh, you know, amniotes and mammals where we don't know what the order is. Lots of things happen in the mammalian brain that seem to have appeared out of nowhere, but that's only because we don't know what the stages were because all these other branches have died off. So, so there are gaps. But the problem with the, the gap between chimps and humans is um, that we don't have anything in, in between. We have human behavior and we have chimp behavior, um, but um, we don't have you know, and any, any sequence of getting from one to the other. And so there I would, I would essentially say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that the evolutionary approach will be able to go from um, all the way to humans. But what I would claim, however, and I still think it's very important, is that an evolutionary approach will be able to tell you if you have got 12 different theories about humans, the evolutionary approach will be able to tell you which 10 of them are just out of the running because they're not compatible with our theory of primates. Um, so in other words, you can stop wasting your time with the theories of humans that are not compatible with the history up until prime uh, chimps, let's say, right? And so that gives you that gives you, I think, a very important set of constraints, right? That now every, any theory of human behavior has to be, you, you know, I don't know what you're gonna come up with to, to bridge that gap, but whatever it is that bridges that gap, it has to be compatible with what's there on that side of the gap. Um, and if we could actually have, and I'm not, I'm not saying that we're going to necessarily have anytime soon a good theory of chimp behavior, um, but I think, um, having one or having even a, um, you know, the, the, the sketch of a plausible theory of chimp behavior will let you eliminate all kinds of theories of human, uh, of the human brain that, uh, that otherwise you wouldn't, right? And so I think that in that sense, I think it's really useful. It's, it's like, a, it's like a, uh, another challenge to anyone wanting to explain humans. Say, okay, well, fine, that's a great, that's a great story but it's just not compatible with all of this information. So, you know, you know this, this idea about that consciousness has something to do with microtubules. 
to be come yes, across this one. Yeah. I think it just goes right out the window, right? I think that exactly. that theory just 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 forget about it. <laughs> it's 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 not it's just out the window. Just don't waste your time. It's not going to happen. Our microtubules didn't change to give us consciousness that, you know, I mean, I don't know, somebody can argue that, but I think I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to look elsewhere for a, a, a good theory of, of, of human cognition. Um, and so I think it's that kind of thing that, that, that we'll have. Now, and, and again, and it's going to be very, I actually think that if we had a good theory of the primate or chimp or something, then we'll have a starting point. We'll have, let's say, the pieces from which one would have to construct that theory of the human brain. So for example, if you want to build your human brain on the idea of a computer with a memory storage and a CPU or something, that's not going to work, right? But if you have a theory of the brain where you have you know, a, um, a primate-like brain with, um, with, you know, with a, I'm not going to get into the, the, the particular details, but you know, with a, you know certain processing streams that that exist, a ventral um, uh, striatal uh, cerebral system and a dorsal striatal cerebral system organized in the way that we see in in primates, and certainly seems to be the way in humans. If we have um, a, a hippocampus, which fundamentally was about uh, navigation, but later became a device for doing mnemonics by some kind of using a machine that was really for, for uh, building maps, you know, really was, was involved in, in building some kind of a map of space in some kind of landmark way, later somehow connected up and involved in constructing episodic memories in some way, my point is that if we had a theory, we'd know what pieces we have to work with to build that theory of what did the humans do with that brain they inherited? What were the, you know, again, now here it's unconstrained, right? Because it could have been constructed in 20 different ways. And we still don't know which of those ways are, are better, but at least you can throw away the 2000 other ways that are not compatible with that ancestral state. So I, I think it, it helps. I think it would help. Um, and we do, you know, and, and the thing that always strikes me is, um, you know, humans are really different and um, my life is very different than the life of a monkey. But if you look at the topological, um, you know, diagram, the brains look pretty similar, you know. There, there, there are some differences, and those are worth uh, paying attention to. But by and large, it really looks looks the same. And if you have a, a a monkey trained to do a task, and then you have a human to whom you explain, here's the task, and you look at what the neural activities are like to the degree that you can you can see them, it looks pretty similar. Uh, and that's that's, I think, very important. Um, and again, everyone pretty much in neuroscience, well, I don't know if everyone, but many people in neuroscience read papers about animals. And that already implies that they believe that it's useful to look at what we share with those animals. Uh, and, and then what I'm, and what I'm saying is if we want to build a model of an animal brain, a primate brain, um, then having evolution as part of your strategy for building that model is better than not having it. And, and, and I think ultimately, whatever theory somebody comes up with is gonna be one that is actually informed by, by all that. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're, you know the, um, a lot of extinctions happened, but there's a lot of clever people out there working out what those, what those stages were despite all that. Um, and, and it's only going to get better, I think, in terms of our understanding of genetics and development, et cetera. There's, I was actually very encouraged once I started really jumping into this field, just how much is out there. I mean, uh, of course, yeah, you are giving a lot of space to the religious people when you're saying that humans are quite different. Um, but Well, no, not really. No, because I'm, <laughs> I'm saying they're different. They're different, you know, you know again, hummingbirds, are pretty amazing too in their own way right 
um, bats also, right? There's a lot, every, you know, animals excel in various ways. We excel in uh, most, I think, you know, the biggest thing that we're so amazing in is, is language um, um, and social structure, but, but, you know, social structure is pretty so sophisticated in, in other primates as well. I think what makes our social structure explode is is most is largely due to due to language um, and what we can accomplish with language. So I think that that's really the big thing. I, I think the big step in that seven million year gap is a lot to do with language um, and what you can do with it. It's not so much that it changes changes the brain. It's that once you have it, what you can do with it, what you can accomplish with it is is pretty amazing. Uh, but it's just like, just like, you know, you can say civilization, right? I mean, our brain is not that different from cavemen. Uh, and yet our lives are very different. So, so, and it's not because we evolved in some particular way. So, you know, again, I, I don't think we're, you know, if you look at, again, if you look at the brain of a human and a monkey, they're not that different at, at that kind of anatomical level. It's what you do with it, I think and how we've used it, that's, that's remarkable. But no, I don't think it's because we have a soul or twitching microtubules. I don't think that's it. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if not thousands, we are still like hundreds of years away um, to reach to a level where uh, we can simply just take a genome sequence and, you know, understand um, I don't know, topology of the brain, et cetera, right? Mm. Uh, because this, this is interesting in a way because at least now we have tools to um, even get the uh, genomes of uh, fossils, uh, yeah. which can really uh, fill that gap in our yeah. understanding, right? Yeah, well, what, what I think would be great is if we could infer the genome of extinct species exactly. and, and then grow them in a vat, right? And then study them. But I, I think that's far away for now. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, no, I, I um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's, there's, uh, there are a lot of techniques that are becoming possible now that will open up, I think, uh, avenues of inquiry that I think will be really exciting, provided that people follow it, that look into it, right? And there was also this news, right, that the uh, the pe people or scientists are trying to um, uh, to 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 sort of uh, build the new species or uh, mo mostly basically the extinct species mastodons, for example, to mm. uh, to try to see if they can uh, just take this genome and uh, uh, try with elephants and see if they can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be that would be fascinating. I mean, I think if you yeah, if you have a if you have an intact genome, and if you can if you can, um, I think simulate the birthing environment well enough. Uh, but I don't know what's involved in that. I mean, I think the the processes in the in the womb must be pretty important to get right. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it would be interesting. Um, yeah, exactly. it'd be interesting, yeah, frankly, really... to get some of those big, to fill some of those big gaps. Yeah, I mean, most some likely we'll, we'll fail uh, probably now, but I think that just opens another door that in the future we, we, we will uh, reach there, you know, to, to have that technology. Yeah, well, it would be fantastic. Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. I agree. But yeah. I don't think I'm going to see it in my lifetime. Um, Probably, okay, so yeah. what what else do you recommend uh, uh, to the audience that they can read um, and about your work, for example, and the other people in the field? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, what I would, what, one thing I would recommend is don't read what all your friends read. You know, don't, don't read what all your colleagues read because you're going to hear about that stuff anyway. Um, uh, you know, it's good to it's good to do something a little different and get another insight. Even even if you wind up wasting your time some of the time, um, it's good to look into another field um, uh, and see what they're doing. Uh, because uh, you know, 
there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, and it, and it, it always has some repercussions. You know, when I started reading the evolution stuff, um, I was always interested in it, but I didn't get around to doing it essentially until I took a sabbatical essentially with that goal is I'm going to finally start reading this stuff seriously. And uh, it really changed a lot of my, my thinking. So again, go, go read something else, go read something different. Um, you know, not just um, what's familiar, um, but that's hard, you know, <laughs> and it's kind of obvious. I think everybody knows this. It's, it's how to find the time that I can't tell you because that's, that's too hard. And I have, I have trouble finding the time. Um, but yeah, that I can, that I can definitely recommend it. Speaking of time, I should, I should wrap it up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, once I get started, it's tough to shut me up, but, um, but I do have to go. Yeah. But it was, uh, um, a lot of things that you shared and I think, um, a very helpful information for the, for the early career researchers like me, uh, the people who are interested in neuroscience and they can, um, look at neuroscience and the brain differently now after listening to the conversation. Um, well, I guess then it's the last part that's most useful. Yeah, read, read what other people don't read because then, then you'll have something to bring to them, you know, exactly. and you'll have something new to tell them about. Um, yeah. 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 So thank you so much for accepting the invitation, uh, coming sure. to the podcast and sharing all the uh, interesting ideas that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me.